where do we, oh no. The, uh, usually it's all kind of seamless, but not that time. The, uh, as they pulled the TV forward, I'm just going to tell you we're uh, continuing our series today on the cure for stupid. And if you're new with us today, let me just kind of give you a little background on that. I believe that Jesus, who died for us, that he cures our sins, he takes those away. Unfortunately, he does not cure stupid, and I really wish he did. And I do believe that if we study and apply the Bible, that it will cure us of a lot of the ridiculous things that we tend to do, especially when it comes to Christians and their behavior and how they should behave in the world. And what we're going to be talking about today is having a worldview that you have a worldview, you already have one, but what we're going to talk about today is having a biblical worldview and how we must continuously strive to get that in place. Somebody put together a really good definition of what that means that I want to read to you, and it's basically this. A person's worldview consists of the values, ideas, or fundamental belief system that determines his attitudes, beliefs, and ultimately, actions. And so your worldview is what you use to see the world, to determine reality, to understand how it works, and it is your definition of everything around you. It is your definition of everything around you. I actually think it's kind of funny. I don't know if any of you have ever watched uh, any... anything like that, and they get their name called out, and they go to the stage, and they stand behind the microphone, and in their speech, to receive this award. Can we just admit that, that, that they're not using that word correctly? I guess, so what you're telling me is of your peers got together and said, hey, we not only think that you're doing a great job, but we think you're doing it the best. So in front of millions of people, we got together this hall, and we got together a group of millionaires, and they're going to give you a tiny gold statue that you get to brag about for the rest of your life. We hope that doesn't crush your spirit. I remember once in college that there was a girl that I had kind of a thing for, oh, that sounds weird, I kind of a, I thought she was cute, and uh, no, it's not Angie, don't go there, so I was trying to work up the nerve to talk to her, and I found her in the library one day, and so I walked up to her, and I said, so hey, what you doing? And she said, I'm minding my own business, what are you doing? Yeah, that was humbling. <laughs> that took me down a notch. Uh, and there were no rewards that day, I promise you that much. Uh, how we define the world affects how we interact with it and how we view it, how we determine how to handle problems, how we determine what is and isn't a problem. And I could stand up here and lay out... Quick, short order of the fact that everybody has a worldview and oftentimes they contradict. And so, basically, I want to give you uh, kind of two main points with some points underneath that, just to talk about how we need to be developing a biblical worldview and, and what that looks like and what it doesn't look like, because that's just as important. So if you look inside your bulletin, you'll see some notes. Uh, there's some blanks that you can fill in as we go along, if you like. Also, the verses of Scripture we'll be looking at. There's a link in there if you want to use your iPhone instead. But uh, go ahead and take those out if you'd like. And what we're going to do is we're going to go ahead and jump right in. And so the first one is this. view is viewing all of life through the Bible. A biblical worldview is viewing all of life through the Bible. 
The interesting thing about faith is that we're all growing in our faith and we're growing closer to the Lord as we continue to live for him. But the interesting thing is that we also vary in our faith when it comes to different areas of life. Some of us may be good in trusting God and trying to live a biblical worldview when it comes to our family, but not our job. Or maybe we do it very well at our job, but not with our finances. Or maybe with our finances, but not with our hobbies. Or maybe, you know, some other area. And we need to view all of life, social things, hobbies, finances, our professional life, our physical life, our spiritual life, all of those things need to be viewed through the Bible, not just what we deem spiritual stuff. And very often that's what we do. We compartmentalize our Christianity. Well, it makes sense here, but it doesn't make sense here. Well, it makes sense there, but not in this spot here. Well, I like what it does for me there, but not so much in this spot. And so we tend to just kind of say, well, that's okay, and over here, but then other places we shut it out. And it just doesn't work that way. So the first thing we need to realize, well, let me read this verse of Scripture to you first. It says, don't copy the behavior and customs of this world, but let God transform you into a new person by changing the way you think. Then you will learn to know God's will for you, which is good and pleasing and perfect. What we're talking about when it comes to a biblical worldview, it's not just a switch that you flip. It is something that you get better at and grow deeper in over time. This is a description of a process. And while the word worldview is never used in the Bible, you can see it very plainly right here, that we don't copy the custom and behaviors of the world, but God transforms us by the way that we think. As we read the Bible, understand it, and apply it, it will change how we, view, how we just simply view life. Because what the Bible does is it gives us an understanding of reality. It gives us an understanding of what the world really is. One of the uh, things I find interesting is that there was a, uh, a gentleman... Uh, he grew up in a house. Uh, they had a belief system that caffeine was evil. That, you know, it was just wrong. Anything with caffeine in it, you shouldn't touch it. Uh, which just makes me very sad deep down inside. And now I can tell you this. I do believe that coffee is a drug. A warm, delicious drug. It's the best. And he kind of got away from his family, their way of thinking, and that religion... But even up into his adult years, every time he took a sip of Coke, there'd be this pang of guilt because of the way that he'd been raised. And so the Bible doesn't just show us what is wrong, but it also shows us what's absolutely, totally okay. And so as we expose ourselves to what reality is, as the Bible describes it, we will be able to grow and live out that worldview. And not only just live in such a way where we're doing the right things, but not be bothered by things that are perfectly okay. Okay? So as we take a look at this, that it's a view through all of life is what biblical worldview is. Two points I want to make underneath that is this. The first one is this. Everything we expose ourselves to has a worldview. Everything. Everything. Everything, everything that we expose ourselves to has a world view. Now, when we take a look at worldviews, the first thing that pops into our head is media. Every news show, every movie, every blog post, every book, all that kind of stuff. And all of that is true, and it does have an effect on the way that you think. But what we also need to realize is that every people group that we hang out with has a worldview as well. Your family, where you work, the social groups that you hang out with, whether it's CrossFit or a bowling alley or a comic book store, uh, at your school, your college professor and his classroom, okay, your family, everyone, every group setting has a predominant worldview. And it is people that has the real effect on our worldview more than anything else. 
Because as we socialize with people and just in casual conversation, there is not only an exposure to those worldviews, but with every worldview, there is also a push. In fact, that's even not really the right word. It's more of a nudge. There's a nudge because every single person in here, whatever our worldview is, whether we've written it down and, or we've just, it's just kind of there subconsciously, we all believe that that worldview is the view that everyone should have. Otherwise, we would not have it. And so with every worldview, sometimes, especially in, in, in certain media and movies and that sort of thing, it can come across very heavy-handed. This is the way you should think. Uh, but more often than not, it's subconscious and gradual, and it's just a nudge in a certain direction. Uh, I do a little bit of woodworking. Uh, I'm an amateur at best. Uh, I do enjoy it. And so I, uh, I try to read about better ways to do it. And if you're a woodworker, then you will recognize this name, Norm Abrams. Anybody know who I'm talking about? He's the boss. He's the man. Yes. He's awesome. So uh, I read a book uh, about uh, a long time ago, and it's, it's really, it's, it's, it's about the basics of woodworking. And so he gave this story that is just uh, amazing to me, where men would get together and they would be framing a house. And one of the men puts up a wall. He puts up the studs, okay? There's no drywall yet. It's just the wood. And so he would put it up. And then another guy would come along, and he would measure everything, and everything would be off. And they'd immediately get into an argument. You were supposed to do it like this. These are dimensions. I did do it that way. It's exactly the way it's supposed to be. And there's... And then Norm would come into the situation. I talk about him like he's a best buddy or something. And then Norm, you know, my friend Norm would step in. Uh, he would bring the two guys together and he would say, all right, guys, pull out your tape measures. And he would get one that he didn't use for anything else and they would take their tape measures and they would line them up and he would see that one of them was wrong. You do that kind of work like framing and you use a tape measure over and over and over again, how you use it is very simple. You take it, you pull it out, there's a hook on the end, you hook it on something and you pull. And then you hook it on something and you pull and you, and you a tight pull so that you can make sure that you've got an accurate measurement. And you do that over and over and over again. And what happens is that over time, the metal in the blade begins to stretch. And because it's on this part right here, this part gets elongated slowly over time. And it skews the entire measurements. And so he would just say, I'm sorry, man, but you need to get a new tape measure. Because we think that the worldview that we have is perfect. We think that it's okay, but sometimes we need a new worldview because it's been diluted. And that feeds into the next point that I want to make. Because everything we expose ourselves has a worldview, a biblical worldview can get diluted. It can get blurred. Everywhere we go, there is a worldview, and there is a current that takes place with it that is constantly pushing up against the worldview that we currently have. And that current, that dilution can come from a lot of different sources. It can come from media. It can come from social groups. It can also come from our own sinful nature. Uh, I don't want to get too deep into it, but Andy Stanley talks... Uh, he does a sermon about four things that every church struggles with and loses sight of, and they have to constantly reorient themselves to. They have to constantly remind themselves that the people on the outside of the church are more important than the people on the inside of the church. They have to constantly remind themselves that it's not about doing certain things, it's about God's grace. And he goes over and just covers those four things because every church everywhere deals with those four currents and has to constantly make sure that they're reorienting themselves so that they're living out the biblical principles as well as they possibly can. And so we're constantly having that current. And one of the things that I'm always talking to my girls about is who they hang out with. And we should never just 
disassociate ourselves unless there's, you know, there's some kind of, uh, I don't know, Y'all know what I'm talking about. I mean, there, there, there's something hurtful that could take place. But, you know, just, just normal, everyday people, we shouldn't just seclude ourselves from certain ones. But there are certain people that we chum with, that we make very good friends, or date, or marry. And if we've lectured them once, we have lectured them dozens of times about the importance of the people that you call your closest friends, you have to make sure that they're not... People with an opposing, an overly opposing worldview or an unbiblical worldview. One time I was walking uh, through, the, through the tent building over here, and uh, this is before this building even existed. And we had some tables and chairs kind of in that hallway. This is back when we used to have this service. We held it over there in the tent building. And I was walking through that main hallway, and there was a guy there. And uh, a young lady that I knew, I didn't know him, I knew her. Uh, she'd been coming here for years. And so I pass him by, and he's got on a baseball cap with a Superman logo on it. Well, my nerd radar goes off, right? I'm like, oh, cool. I can, here's something we can relate on. So I just kind of walk over to him and I go, hey, man, I saw the, the Superman logo on your hat. Are you a DC fan? And he said, And I quote, oh, that, that's me. I'm Superman. To which I said, please say more words right now. (laughs) A lot of people, when they run into somebody like this, they get all upset. I find it to be an opportunity to laugh and laugh and laugh. And as he went on to talk about himself, nothing else, you could see he would, oh my God, the most arrogant human being I've ever met in my life. We've all run into those teenage boys that are just a little bit full of themselves, you know, but I mean, this kid, I mean, he was king turd on Punk Mountain. I, that mountain is a place where hair products and Axe body spray abounds. Um, and he was just telling me about how awesome he was. And finally, I just kind of went, cut, uh, hold that thought. And the girl that he was sitting next to, they were sitting kind of close. And I don't know what it is. It's because, well, it's because I'm a father of girls. And so I just have this weird thing that goes off in my head when I, when I get overly concerned about any girl like 18 or younger. This, this, this dad just comes out. And so I told him, you know, I just hold that thought. I turned to her and asked out loud, please tell me you are not dating this. <laughs> I try not to say certain things, but the... Have you ever been so overcome with bile for another human being that your filter just goes, I'm out, and it just all comes out? Please tell me you're not dating this. And she went, oh, yeah. And I'm just like, oh, my God. I didn't do that inside, like hidden. Like like physically, he could tell. I'm just like, oh, no. And I just, because I knew, here's the good news. They broke up like a week and a half later. I'd like to think I had a part, but the, <laughs> I just, I knew that her dating that non-contributing zero after a while was going to dilute her perspective on everything, on life. And it just, I just, I couldn't take it because we have to be so careful. This isn't talking about separating ourselves from certain people, as you'll see in just a minute. This is about making sure that we're constantly reorienting ourselves so that no matter what we expose our to, ourselves to, no matter what we associate with, no matter where we go, no matter what we, we read, see, whatever, that we're constantly reorienting our compass to true north, which I really do believe is the Bible. Because there's a constant 
we're, we're in that current right now. There's a constant current to, to throw that off kilter. Okay? All right. So, that was point number one. Everything has a worldview, and we must see everything through a biblical worldview, all of life. And the second thing that I want to share with you is this. A biblical worldview is seeing other worldviews as opportunities, not enemies. A biblical worldview is seeing other worldviews, regardless of what they are, as opportunities and not enemies. Can I just give you all a little side micro-sermon real quick? Guys, there's a lot of news outlets out there that are simply feeding off your hatred for other people. There are so many voices out there and they get other people with the same voice, and they just interview one another, and they feed each other stupid, and we just get all wound up, and we just, they just feed off of our hatred for other people. And as Christians, we cannot live that way. As Christians, we're not supposed to do that. We're not allowed to do that. This is a verse of Scripture from James And the first phrase here is the wisdom from above. Basically, biblical thinking. Uh, Wisdom uh, very often refers to not just having a certain knowledge base, but actually living that out. It's it's followed by actions, okay? And the wisdom from above is, of course, wisdom that comes from God as we see displayed in Scripture. But the wisdom from above is first of all pure, meaning moral. Moral. It is also peace-loving, gentle at all times, and willing to yield to others. It is full of mercy and the fruit of good deeds. It shows no favoritism and is always sincere. And those who are peacemakers will plant seeds of peace and reap a harvest of righteousness. Having an opposing worldview doesn't mean that we get to view those without that exact same worldview as some kind of enemy that we're supposed to attack. But there are opportunities. If you read the book of Acts, Acts is the fifth book in the New Testament. It is the sort of a, a history of the establishment of the early church. And please understand that what we're talking about is Paul going all through Europe and making the first Christians in a lot of those places. It isn't that he would go to a town and find the local church and set up shop there and say, hey guys, let's go win some more people for Jesus. He would go to a town, him being the only Christian, period, surrounded by a lot of different worldviews, all of which he often used as an opportunity to share with them the gospel of Jesus Christ. Whether they were Jews or something else, he always approached them where they were and he would share with them with grace and mercy and love and sincerity the gospel of Jesus Christ. Because he saw every single one of those places as an opportunity, not a place to go and start yelling and screaming. We need to see people with opposing worldviews as opportunities, not enemies. First point I want to make on this is is this one. It's coming. There it is. It is our job to recognize them, meaning other worldviews, opposing worldviews. It's our job to recognize them, not hide from them. It's our job to recognize them, not hide from them. Uh, you know, we homeschool our kids. And my, I'll be real honest, my first exposure to homeschooling, it was as a teenager, and it was not positive at all. 
And there's kind of an inside joke among homeschoolers where we go, oh, you're homeschooled, so are you a genius or a moron? Because it seems like you either get really bad parents doing it or parents that know what they're doing. Uh, I met one of the morons. So I was just, moron's a strong word. Um, So yeah, moron. Um, I just, I was so, so upset with what I saw. And I just, it tainted my view of homeschool from that point on. And what I've come to understand is that, you know, how you, you meet somebody and you just kind of lump them into a group and you just kind of figure everybody's that way. And so what I found uh, is I met other homeschoolers who did it right and do it very well and are amazing at it. And then we're striving, Angie, is striving to do the same thing. And uh, one of the things that I've discovered is that there's really kind of two major types of homeschoolers. And there's the kind that is trying to shield them from everything I homeschool so that they don't have exposure to anything in the outside world. And then there's the homeschoolers that say, I homeschool so that I can see what they're being exposed to. So I can know what it is that they're being exposed to. So that we can look at these things and look at these issues and look at the world together. It's kind of like this. We've all, as, as parents, we've been in that situation where uh, the kid comes up to us and says, you know, oh, there's this movie, and I want to see it. Can I please see it? And we're like, uh, I don't know. What's it rated? And you're just like, They're, it's PG-13. Oh, well, that doesn't tell me anything. And so, you know, the, uh, you, know you just kind of go back and forth. Well, tell me the name of the movie. And you're like, oh, some of those words sound weird. And so, you know, you just kind of go back and forth. And what eventually happens is one of two things. If we give in, one of two things happens. We either say, okay, well, go in that room over there where I will not be, and then go watch that movie, and I'll just see what anything weird happens to your behavior, I guess, and you can just tell me about it. Or we sit down with them and watch the movie together. And we tell them, listen, here is what that worldview is. Here's what they're trying to communicate. And you can kind of go through those things, and you can say, well, that's true. That is a good worldview. That's something that you should do. Well, that's completely wrong. That's something, well, that's 80% right, but here's this 20% that just kind of skews the whole thing. Well, that could be true if that situation were to ever happen, but it never will. And so you just kind of take them, and you break all of these things down, and you help them to recognize the worldview not stick their fingers in their ears and their head in the sand and just pretend like it's not there. Because, let's be honest, folks, we have adults that do the same thing. They just go to the internet, go to imalwaysright.com, and then just read that stuff, and then nothing else. And then if there's an opposing worldview, they just stick their fingers in their ears and just ignore it. And that's not how Christians are supposed to operate. As you see Paul interacting with all of these different worldviews, different religions, different ideas, different philosophies, different teachings, he always understood the direction they were coming from, and he always met them where they were. And it's our job to recognize these worldviews and why they would believe that. Not to hide from them, not to pretend that they're not there. Nope, not yet. Um... He jumped ahead, sorry. The, we need to make sure that we're taking our time to recognize them. And the big key, the big key to that is making sure that we're established in the Bible and we have a good establishment on our worldview there as well. Otherwise, it makes seeing those things a little bit more difficult. Okay? Last point is this. A biblical worldview is not a license to be obnoxious. I tried to think of a nicer way to say that, but couldn't come up with one. I didn't try that hard. The, um, a biblical worldview is not a license to be obnoxious. And if, if I could just have a moment of uh, honesty with you, this is something that, as a pastor, and I think a lot of pastors, can very easily struggle with. 
I've gone to Bible college. I've taken scores of classes on Bible study. I know all the ologies. I know all of the fancy words, and I know all of the systems for study, and I know all, you know, all the doctrines and all that kind of stuff. And it's very hard sometimes when I, when I see an opposing, especially if it's another Christian, and they're, they're just not quite right in the way that they're describing something, and I just want to jump in, and I just want to change it, you know, and, and that, that desire to change another person's thinking so it's right, or at least my view of right, is something that can be overpowering at times. And instead of being helpful, you're just being obnoxious. And we need to make sure that we're very careful with this. We need to make sure that what we do and what we say and how we say it is filled with that grace and love and sincerity that was mentioned in James. Tomorrow, there's going to be a group of about 60 to 80 people here, the, my, the minority of them, no, the majority of them, being teenagers. And what they're going to do is they're going to go out, they're going to kind of meet here first, and they're going to get together and they're going to do some survey work kind of in the surrounding area uh, because we're helping another group kind of possibly find a place for another church plant. And so what's going to happen is they're going to go out and they're just going to talk to people and kind of get their viewpoints on, on different things, okay? And the story that I'm about to share with you right now is the same story I'll be sharing with them tomorrow. Because I used to be a pastor in Spring Lake and I was there for a while. And it was early in my ministry and I didn't realize that there are parts of Spring Lake that you don't go to alone, um, I went to a kind of a dangerous part of Spring Lake called Spring Lake and <laughs> decided to start doing some survey work. Um, I knew all this afterwards because I told them where I went and they were like, what? And so I was going through a trailer park and it's the afternoon. So, you know, a lot of people aren't home. And so I'm finding a few people. And so finally I go and I find a trail. There's a couple of cars parked outside and I knock on the door and the door opens and I am hit with a wave of marijuana smoke. I mean, it is just, I mean, it just, it, it, I, mean, I actually felt myself kind of get pushed back. I had to reorient myself. I mean, there was a there were some bright lights and a couple of unicorns that came out. I'm just like, oh, I want to pet the unicorn. Wait, what? Um, and, I mean, it was strong stuff. What is it about marijuana? All you have to do is smell it once. It could be 20 years ago, and you never forget the smell. And so there's just two guys in there. So, I mean, they've got a real clam bake going. Uh, don't ask me how I know what that is. The, um, and... He just comes to the door and he goes, what's up? And I said, oh, I think I'm about to die. That's, I think that's what's up. And I tried very hard to make sure between the moment of smelling what was going on in there and him coming to the door uh, very, very quickly to just get rid of any kind of obnoxious look on my face that I could. And I immediately told him who I was and what I was doing. I said, my name is Barry Jones. I'm a pastor at a church in Spring Lake, and I'm here to just kind of, I got a few survey questions, but I really just want to talk to you about some of your ideas about church. And folks, let me tell you something. I got some of the best and honest information from those two guys than anyone else. And they shared with me all of their thoughts. They shared with me all of those things that we hear from people who don't want to go to church, it's full of hypocrites and they just want money and they don't have the right clothes and yada, yada, yada. And I talked to them about all those things and I said, you know, look, uh, my church, this is where it's at. Um, if you want to go there, that'd be awesome. Maybe try out another church if you like. That'd be cool too. Uh, I'd love to know that you were going to church. Uh, but, but, you know, I promise you, you're dressed fine and you can go. And I don't know if they went to church but I know that they wouldn't have if I had come knocking on the door with this real, I don't know, holier-than-thou look on my face or judgmental face when they, when, I, when they answered the door. We have to make sure that our biblical worldview is not a license to be obnoxious and to try and put people in their 
proper place. When we first went over this, what we talked about is how the Bible is primarily about God. It's about us too, but ultimately, primarily, it's about God. And the message of the Bible is God's grace and the good news that we are saved through Jesus Christ. Not just a list of do's and don'ts. It's that too. But ultimately, it's about God's grace. It's not about what we have to do. It's about what Jesus has done. And what this communicates, obnoxiousness, what it communicates is, well, this is what I've done, now you need to do it too. And instead of that attitude, what we need to do is to be living in such a way, we need to have our actions come out in such a way that we are pointing people to God and to His grace. Because if that's what the Bible is ultimately about, God and His grace through Jesus Christ, and we're living a biblical worldview that is to be transferred into action, then obviously we need to be pointing people to those two things. That can be done through deeds, and that can be done through words. And here's the thing. If you pray this prayer, God will honor it, so do it carefully. If you start looking for opportunities, start setting up opportunities, and start praying for opportunities to share Jesus with someone else, it will happen. And we need to make sure that when we're doing that, we're doing it in a way that communicates his love and his grace and acceptance. I would, uh, that same time when I was a senior pastor in Spring Lake, uh, every now and again, I would, uh, there used to be a Dunkin' Donuts in Spring Lake, and I would go there, and I would hang out for an hour. And I would always take a book with me and just read. Uh, but on my way there, I would just pray, God, if there's anybody there that I can talk to about you, let them be there. Just give them an open mind, an open heart. Give me the right words. Give me wisdom. And more often than not, I wouldn't talk to anybody. I would just read my book. But on several occasions, I got the chance to talk to someone about Jesus. And I'll never forget, there was this one lady, and again, the same questions, the same hang-ups that people have when they don't want to go to church. Uh, you know, can, can God really love someone like me, was her question. And I said, let me share something with you. On my way here, every time I come here, I pray that God will give me someone to talk to. And today, I'm talking to you. That means God chose you. And just tears. Uh, folks, we're going to get so much farther. Uh, pointing people to God, pointing people to His grace. Then we are with, I told you so's, and here's what you should do's. Um, one of the things that uh, I challenge people with, and, and this, is, this is a big challenge, but I, you, you can't talk about the Bible having that worldview and not talk about God's grace. They're inseparable. And one of the things that, that I challenge you to do is I talk about the, the five, five, and five. You take five names, people that don't know Jesus or maybe they just haven't been to church in a long time or they've strayed away. Five people, you pray five minutes a day and you shoot for five times a week. That's it. And if somebody gets saved, they come back to God, you take that name off, you put on a new one. That's it. And I'm not talking about going to their house and banging on the door and preaching at them. You know, a lot of times you can share Jesus with somebody just by just saying, you know what, I heard that you were going through that situation. I want you to know I'm praying for you. That's it. And you allow God to show you what, what to say and, and where that wisdom should be. And you just, you just pray for those opportunities and you keep an eye open for those opportunities. But if we're going to have a biblical worldview that we're acting on, that means pointing people to God 
ultimately, pointing people to God and pointing people to his grace. It does mean living a certain way, yes, but ultimately, it's the salvation that comes through Jesus Christ. Uh, And as a perfect segue, we have these. If you're someone that's been coming to church for a while, and you've never accepted Jesus as your personal Savior, where you know that you know, you know that Jesus is your forgiver, you've asked him to forgive you, and he's your leader, you're trying to live the life that he would have you live. If you haven't done that, these are our blue bags, and they're on a table right back there. If you're ready to take that step of faith, go back there, grab one of these, and don't leave. Somebody will unpack this with you and explain in like eight minutes what it means to have Jesus as your forgiver and your leader. Uh, We also have our... uh, Communion stations, we've got one in the back right over there and one over here to the side if you want to just take part in communion. We also have our uh, cross if you want to come over here a little bit further away if you want to spend some time in prayer. We've also got people on the sides here who will pray with you if you just ask. But a biblical worldview means furthering the kingdom of God and his influence. And so my, my challenge to you today is to simply... Begin that time alone with God, to be praying with God. God, what would you have me do? Is there a person you would have me speak to? Is there a situation that I can create, like going to Dunkin' Donuts? What is it that, that you would want me to do? And that is where we really start to be not just believers, of the Bible, but doers of it.